So I wanted to start off today by borrowing something, a little thing that I learned off Facebook recently from Howard Choi. Because uh, in fact, uh, one of the things that I've learned about Feng Shui is I I'm a very uh, tactile person. I like to go out and experience things myself. So I've run Feng Shui tours of uh, Hong Kong and China for many years. And I've also attended a number of Feng Shui tours too. So I thought as an introduction to what I'm uh, what I know and uh, also the research that I've been doing over in China, uh, that's the topic of my talk today. And one, so I thought I'd start on the global perspective, on the, on the macro perspective, and talk about uh, what we call Hershan. So Hershan is about, is what um, is called uh, bringing out the image. It's about bringing out, looking at something uh, from a feng shui perspective, with feng shui eyes, and bringing out the image of what you think that, that means, you see. And this is part of the form school of feng shui. So this is the very subjective part. It, it's the part where we use our own interpretation of what something looks like. So I want to start by showing you the map of China and to ask you, what shape do you think it represents? The heart. The heart, yes. Could be a heart. Yeah. What else do you think? Any other suggestions? What does the shape look like? Yeah. It's actually an animal. It's a chicken. A dog. A rooster. Who said rooster? Very good. Actually, it's a chicken. A chicken or a rooster. Uh, to the Chinese people, this is what they uh, they say is the shape of China. Uh, it looks like a chicken. And uh, if you think about it, uh, what well, a chicken sustains, you know, the billions of population of Chinese people, they eat a lot of ch chicken. So when we look at the map of China, we see some interesting things, right? Here is the head of the chicken. There's the body of the chook, the breast, the, the legs, and the tail of the chicken is here. So when we look at the tail of the chicken, you see, people always say, why doesn't China give Tibet, free Tibet, and give them back? Well, you see, then they would lose the tail of the chicken, right? So I don't think that they're likely to do that. They, they want to keep the tail intact. See. And all the golden eggs get laid out here. You see. So that's part of the uh, part of the symbolism of, of China. And so they want to keep that all in one piece. You know, the beak of China, uh, the, beak, the beak of the chicken, I should say, is up here. You see. So we see the shape. So that's our that's what we call calling out the image. Um, her, I'm not sure what the word means, but shang means an image or a picture. And in uh, face reading, it's called mian shang. And mian shang means, well, face reading, to read a picture of what you see on the face. So uh, her shang means to call out the image. And I'm going to show you other images. And uh, you can use your creative imagination to, to your interpretation of what those things mean. Okay. So first we start at the neck of the chicken. Well, if the chicken can't eat, it doesn't have any sustenance. And of course, this is where Beijing is located. So on our tour, of course, the most important place to start with is the Forbidden City. And uh, I've been there twice in the last couple of years uh, to uh, study the feng shui there. And I found out, firstly, that it's called, it's actually called the Forbidden, uh, Purple Forbidden City, uh, Zijing Cheng. I think my pronunciation is okay. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, Z or Z, uh, the word Z is actually means uh, the purple. And it's the name of the pole star in the sky. So in the southern hemisphere, we don't, we can't see the pole star, and we can't see the the, the big dipper. Uh, so you're probably familiar with that star constellation up here. In fact, last week I was in, uh, well, I've been in Israel for a week. I was teaching face reading there, and while I was there in the countryside, I was looking up at the sky. Even though it was the second day of the full moon, uh, I could still see the um, the constellation of the Great Bear. Uh, which is called Bei Do in Chinese, and it's the seven stars. It looks like a saucepan, you know that one? And uh, every, uh, every uh, year it rotates around the pole star, which is called North Celestial Pole. You see? So uh, the pole star is sort of the center of the universe in the Chinese way of thinking. And in heaven, the pole star represents the center of the universe. It's the, the celestial pole that the Earth rotates around its axis pointing towards that point. And over time, over thousands of years, that point actually changes. 
Uh, but it's called the Purple Star, and if any of you have studied Ziwei Daoshu, you would know uh, that it also is purple. The Purple Star is talking about in that in that topic as well. So um, the Chinese say everything that is in heaven is also reflected on earth, and so we have the Forbidden City called the Purple Forbidden City, using the name of the Pole Star to reflect that the Emperor is in his palace uh, as the centre of influence of the world, so to speak. So here's like where the, wor the world rotates around, around him, so that's where the name came from. So this is the Emperor that actually built the Forbidden City, the Yongzhe Emperor, if my pronunciation is good. And uh, he actually uh, died four years after the Forbidden City was built. And I have some theories about that, which I'll share with you. So this is the actual proper gate to the Forbidden City. And you can see it's called the Wu Men Gate. And I wanted to show this because this is the year of the horse. And the character Wu is also the character for horse. And in uh, Feng Shui, this is one of the 12 animal signs. It represents south. So this is the south gate, and it's also the horse gate. So instead of calling it like south gate, which is a bit boring, they call it the horse gate, if you like. So in fact, in the old days, instead of saying north, south, east, and west, the Chinese would use the 24 mountains and, and point to a direction and say what it represented according to the stems and branches and the diagonals of the 24 mountains. So you can see there's three entry points. Uh, the main entry point is for the emperor only. So even, uh, even today, when there's no emperor living here anymore, you're still not allowed to enter through the, this uh, central gate. And uh, you can tell the importance of a building, in architectural point of view, a Chinese building, by the number of bays that it has. So this one has nine bays. Now, a bay is, is uh, the space in between the two poles. That represents one bay. So this is a nine-bay building. It's nine bays, and I think it must be ten poles. Right? Nine bays, ten poles. So, and it's five bays deep, nine bays wide. So that just shows the importance. It's the, it's the, the greatest number of bays, I think, that you can have on any building. And in fact, you know, in the old days in China, nobody was allowed to have anything representing uh, what the emperor had. So uh, I would say that there was no other buildings that were nine bays wide except any ones in the Forbidden City. Okay, so then as we enter the Forbidden City, the most important building, some of the pictures, some of the words haven't come out, but the most important uh, building in the Forbidden City, I would say, is called the, um, the Hall of Supreme Harmony. It's the central building in the uh, Forbidden City, and that's where the emperor would sit when people came to visit him. It's also the highest point. Uh, inside the Forbidden City, and in fact, this version of the uh, Hall of, of, of um, Supreme Harmony uh, is uh, a new building. Uh, the original one was burnt down, and then they built a new one. It's a bit lower, see. But actually, uh, when you when you're up there, um, you can see over the walls to a certain extent of the Forbidden City. So it's like the emperor is able to look out upon his subjects. Uh, and it's also in the centre, and the centre uh, is uh, what we call the, in face reading we call it the Ming Gong, it's this point here on the face. Uh, so if we imagine the Forbidden City as a, as a face, then the centre is uh, where the Forbidden City, where the, um, the Hall of Supreme Harmony is, uh, and that central point is called the seat of the stamp, because um, the emperor would have this gigantic stamp, you know, uh, official seal. And if you've ever seen the movie, The, the, uh, the Last Emperor, uh, you know, it took a, a few men to carry this up to the emperor if he needed to stamp something officially in the movie. It was just this heavy, heavy thing. Uh, so the seat of the stamp is also in face reading at that same point there. And you often see um, paintings of the emperor uh, with a sort of raised area here. It, this is Ming Gong, it's called the Life Palace, and uh, it's, it's sort of raised up on the face. So if someone has this area raised up, it means that they're you know, very uh, official, uh, their, their destiny is very strong. Uh, so, so it's a sort of symbolic thing, it's another way of looking at the symbol, uh, looking at a face, looking at a building, and seeing what we find there. So you see here, this is an old uh, Harper's magazine, and there's the Forbidden City shown. Uh, the roof 
You see, it was actually higher in the old days. That must have been the older building, maybe. But I was trying to find a picture that showed that when the emperor is there, he can look out on his citizens outside the walls of the palace. So this is the chart for the, uh, for the, um, uh, for the not just the, not the whole, not all the buildings of the Forbidden City because some of them have been reconstructed. But this one was built. Uh, uh, it was the construction was finished in 1420, which was period five, and we know that five represents the emperor. So of course um, this is an auspicious time to build your building. And Emperor Yongle, he must have known this, so he built the building in period five. Uh, and he only had four years of the building uh, being a Wangshan Wangshui building before it, was, it became period six. So what I mean by that is, you see, when you look at the chart, uh, the, we have the Water Star 5 at the front in the south, and the Water Star 8, uh, Mount Star 8 in the north at the back. Uh, so this is a very interesting chart because we always say in Feng Shui, mountain at the back, water at the front. Right? So, and we, we know that that's good Feng Shui perspective, right? That's always the best thing. So if we can match the forms, the environment, with the formula that we use, as it were, this is the flying stars formula, and of course it depends on what system that you use, but I specialize in flying stars, so um, that you see that the chart matches the forms. And what I found quite interesting about this chart is uh, if you add up all the numbers in each palace, the water star and the time star, each one adds up to five. So we have all these ones, all these water and time star, each one adds up to the number five. And then if you add up all the, all the water star, a mountain star and the time star, each one adds up to six. So five represents the emperor and six represents heaven. So the emperor rules over heaven. So I see that as a very strong symbol of why they would pick uh, this particular chart to build for the Forbidden City. Is, this is sort of, if you look, if you study flying stars, this would have to be the basic, the, the most important chart in all of the star charts because it's the original one where everything else came from. You know? So, because uh, in China, well, even everybody else wants to copy what the emperor is doing, which is why I want to talk about this building first. Because then, when you go through other places in China, everybody likes to play south. Now, that's of course because the sun arcs around the sky on the south and maybe because the north winds uh, are colder. So you build a house facing south, you get the passive solar effect. So this is part of the environmental uh, influence as well. So you can study a little bit more about that. The Hall of Supreme Harmony in the center and the Mediterranean Gate at the front. You see the water star brings in the, the chi of the number five. So one other thing too, why did he only live, well, until 2000, and, uh, until 19, sorry, until 16, 44 he died because after 1644 it changed to uh, 1624 it changed to uh, period five so the uh, the imperial city lost its auspicious arrangement you know, uh, not for another 180 years would it get it back again or 160 years until the start of period five again okay. well that's my theory all right, so here we see a hill at the back, and this hill is a fake hill. It's called Coal Hill. It was made with coal, and, and they actually brought it in because we want to support the mountain at the back. That's the, the good forms. So even if you build your own mountain, it would take a certain amount of time for the mountain chi to support the building because earth chi rises up through a building or up through... If you create a fake mountain, it will still take a, a certain amount of time to rise up. So if they built that uh, mountain uh, with, before they, they built the Forbidden City, maybe it would have had time to create the mountain effect. But there it is today. And of course, well, here's the rubber ducky. This is the imperial rubber ducky. <laughs> Actually, it's not really good. I just thought I'd include this picture because I like it. Uh, when I was in the, um, uh, Beijing last year, it just happened to be the rubber ducky was at the summer palace. <laughs> so, so here we are in um, uh, a, a very famous and very interesting building. This is modern Chinese architecture. It's the uh, China Central TV building. And uh, when I went on, I went on a tour with Howard Choi a couple of years ago, and one of the first things he asked us to think about was, um, what is the meaning of this building? 
What is the symbolism? What is the image that it calls out to you? So I'd like to have a look at that and then give me some answers. What do you think? What is the image that it portrays to you? What does it look like? Any suggestions? I can tell you what the Chinese call it, but I want you to guess. One guess. A pair of legs, maybe? Actually, the Chinese call it a pair of pants. <laughs> a pair of pants or a pair of pajama pants. <laughs> because it looks like a couple of legs walking. And uh, some of the people who were in the, in the class with uh, Howard, they said, uh, one person said, uh, it looks a bit like um, uh, you know, a giant stamping on all the small people below. <laughs> that type of thing. <laughs> but actually, um, when I went visiting, uh, the, the year after, I went to another area of China and I saw something remarkable. And it reminded me very much of this building. And I wonder if you can see that here. This is the building. And this is called Tianmen Shan. It's a hole, right? It's a hole inside a rock, big enough for a fighter jet to fly through. In fact, they did fly a fighter jet through there once, and they won't let them do it again in case the whole thing collapses. <laughs> and you can see the number of steps there are going up. Uh, so I was quite exhausted when I got to the top, I must say. I thought I was fit, but <laughs> other people were passing me on the way up. It's very, very steep. And uh, you can see the shape, the shape of the hole. Now, Tian means Shan. Tian means heaven. Right? Shan means mountain. So, it, it, and Men is a gate. So, heavenly mountain, a heavenly gate mountain. Right? Those three characters. He, Tian, Men, Shan. So, in, in Feng Shui, we use the word Tian a lot. Tian is heaven, Di is earth. Yeah? So, we use that, those two expressions a, a lot. And uh, so, heavenly gate mountain, it's like the gate that leads to heaven. Right? So, I saw some correlation there yeah. between that hole. Rather than looking at the actual building, I saw that the hole that the building creates is the same as the hole created here. So, I see that as a metaphor for um, China Central TV, the main TV station in China, uh, being uh, all pervasive and spreading like heaven, spreading out in all directions and, and being in a position of, of power and authority. So that's my little bit of her shang about that. So the other thing I noticed last year is that there's very lot of construction in front of that building. And uh, they're actually building another building in front of it. And it just happens to be in the south direction. So in 2014, the south is called the Tai Shui. It's because this year is the year of the horse. So the horse gear is the Tai Shui, and, and if you do any construction in the south of your building uh, in 2014, it can disturb the Tai Shui. So disturbing the Tai Shui can bring about some negative situations, uh, depending on uh, what you're doing and, and what type of construction there is. I mean, but any sort of disturbance, disturbance of the earth, uh, can create disturbance to a building. So uh, I haven't gone into too much detail about what possibly happening there. So now we're going to Shangxi province and I wanted to show you in Shangxi province uh, the pagodas because people often ask me about pagodas and what do they mean? Well actually a pagoda is a symbol of Buddha and in fact when Buddhism came into China uh, the Buddha's relics were brought with uh, the monks who were introducing Buddhism into China and um, pagodas were built, but in the old days, I'll show you an original pagoda, they weren't called pagodas then, original pagoda that was built uh, in, um, you know, to, to house Buddha's relics. So this one, uh, this temple here, or pagoda, inside the underground uh, part of the pagoda is actually a golden room, you see this golden room, and inside the middle of the golden room is a, a relic from the Buddha. Now, relic usually means a piece of bone after he was cremated or something, the actual you know, piece from the Buddha's body. Uh, that's what they call the, the Buddha's relics. And they're very, of course, sacred things. So here's another temple, and this is the oldest wooden, wooden pagoda in uh, China. And uh, we went to see this one with Howard. And inside that building, uh, when they were renovating it, they found a piece of relic, which was Buddha's tooth, that's what they say, inside one of the statues in one of the floors of the building. And you can see how remarkable this tooth is. It actually has purple crystals.
crystals inside of it. So I thought it was really remarkable. So uh, in fact, even just traveling to China for me, I'm, I'm, I won't say I'm Buddhist, but I like Buddhist philosophy. And, and so it's a bit of a pilgrimage for me to see some of these places. So this is actually uh, the original type of uh, pagoda, and it's called a stupa. And it's not the sort of stupa that you get after a hard night on the town. Right? This is a proper Buddhist stupa. <laughs> so, uh, and sh the different shapes of stupas represent different things. So this one uh, represents Nirvana, and it's in Wu Tai Shan in uh, Shaanxi Province. A really amazing, beautiful place. Well worth going to, but quite out of the way. So obviously that must have some Buddhist relics inside it there too. It's one of the oldest ones in, in China. And you see how the, the location of it, there's a mountain here, a mountain at the back, a mountain at the side. The temple, the main temple is built on its own mountain there. And then there's another mountain on, on this side as well. So the, the whole area is called uh, Wu Tai Shan, which means five big mountains. Uh, and uh, well, we see the, the, these the small one here is actually not one of the five big mountains. There are five big mountains around the area. Uh, but it's a very um, protected area. And when you go there, you could be in other parts of China. When you go here, the sun is always, seems to always be shining. Or even if it's snowing, it's very beautiful. And uh, it's one of the only few places left in China where you see real monks. Um, so it's, it's still a working place where monks go, uh, Buddhist monks go and, and live and stay. So there's another picture of standing at the temple looking out. And you see the yellow roof here. A yellow roof indicates an imperial roof. And in fact, the only yellow roofs that are allowed are in the imperial palace. Uh, but they allowed them to build yellow roofs here. Yellow is the color of the emperor. Uh, because the emperor had a lot to do with the building of these uh, temples. And so um, he permitted them to, it's basically an imperial place. So it's allowed to have a yellow roof. Uh, there's some monks there enjoying themselves. All right, so another thing that I learned is that when you have wind chimes, people often, I have a little shop in Melbourne, a feng shui shop, and people come in all the time looking for objects, and they say they want a wind chime to hang in their house, and I say, well, if you're hanging it inside, it's not going to make any noise, right? But if it's hanging outside there, it will make a noise, and it will protect uh, or, or attract some spirits to go there, which is what the Buddhists do too. They use it to attract the spirits to go towards the, the wind chimes. Okay. And maybe instead of coming into the building. So here we are, we moved to Hunan province. And in Hunan province we have a one, wonderful, amazing place, which is the home of the film Avatar. So if you've seen Avatar, you might recognize some of this landscape. It's just incredible. It's called uh, Jang Jia Jie. It's an area there where of the mountains also have wonderful shapes. So here we see the shape of what it looks like a turtle. It's a, build, a, a mountain that looks like a turtle, so they call it a turtle hill. Here's one that looks like fairies. Um, I'm just sniffing the flowers, right? Now, I, I can't remember. Do they actually call it that? I just made that one up myself. <laughs> and then we have another one, golden toad swallowing the moon. So you see the symbolism there. But they actually do give names to all the mountains, uh, special names. And uh, so what we see, somebody else might not see. They might say, oh, that looks like a, I don't know, some other creature, a fanciful creature. Yeah. So on the road to that previous mountain with a big hole in it, uh, there's other symbolism there too. You see how the road is so windy. Well, on the way up is some special animals to help protect the people when they're in the bus going up and down the road. Uh, these are called pisha. So you can see the golden pisha here. It's, it's like uh, pisha is one of the sons of the dragon. The dragon has nine sons, and, and this one has um, like a horn sticking out the back. So you see a couple of examples. Every corner has a golden pisha there. So someone with a lot of money you know, donated these things to help take the pilgrims going up there. And then we move down to um, uh, down, uh, down to uh, Guangdong province, of course. So I want to share this with you, uh, right down south. And this is what we would call the leg of the chicken, you see. The, the chicken can't survive without its leg, and the leg has got a lot of meat on it. Right? So this part of China, there's a lot of productivity, a lot of business comes out of this part of China. 
a lot of export. I, mean, I export products from China, and, and our, our, um, our containers come from here, from this part of China. So this is the Chen Academy of Classical Learning. Somehow the words didn't come out. Classical learning. It's a, it's a, basically the Chen family built a, uh, they wanted to really build a family, um, a family, uh, uh, like altar, family room, family building. But in, they, they couldn't build it uh, above a certain size. So instead of calling it a uh, the family temple, family altar, they, they called it um, an academy of learning. And in fact, a lot of the Chen family members would go there. From, there's 72 Chen families, and they put their money together to build this place. And uh, they would go there to study for the imperial examination. But actually, it wasn't built until the late 18, 1800s. And uh, of course, um, after that uh, early 19th century, the imperial examination stopped. So um, I saw this quote, and it says that architecture is a long river connecting yesterday to today. And on the roof of the building is amazing architecture and amazing um, symbolism. You can walk around in this place, and you can look at it online as well, and see all the different photos of the different um, different uh, symbolic aspects um, representing uh, uh, Chinese opera and, and uh, these these funny creatures, which are called piao, uh, the, the the protective dogs. They have a big mouth, and they have no hole at the other end, so they take in all the bad things, right, and it doesn't come out again. <laughs> Uh, and these drums at the front door, uh, the size of the drums is very large. It, it represents a, a government official or having a high ranking, a high status. And these ones are very large. You see. So they, this is their ambition, you know, to have a high ranking in the government. Uh, that's the whole ambition of passing the imperial examination. So this is the actual room, the imperial, uh, sorry, the, the, um, the family uh, altar. But actually it's not in use, you can see, because otherwise it would have a lot of um, like writing representing the different family members. Uh, so that's at the back of the building, so I think they must have moved the actual family members somewhere else. And it's more like a museum these days. So uh, it's, a, it's an interesting building because they say that they call it a nine halls and six courts building. So you have nine halls, and each hall is higher than the next one. So as you walk in the front door, you're sort of going up and up, and then the uh, family altar is in that building, which is a standard uh, Chinese architecture. I always put the family hall at the back. And this is one reason why we say in Feng Shui, don't open up the front door uh, in a straight line to the back, because it, it's the Sha Chi attacks the family altar. Okay? So you don't usually open up like that, but in, in here, Maybe they felt that there was some space, plenty of space in between. It's just an interesting design. You wouldn't usually see the door coming right in through the front like that. Usually it would be off to one side. See. Or even as you walk in the door, there's actually a spirit wall here. So you can't see straight in. They call it the spirit wall. And the lanes in between, they are to actually prevent fire. You know, fire jumping from one door into another. It's a thing that... Uh, in the old buildings, they're all made of wood. But they really don't want to have fire happening, of course. So it's a period two building, and we see that the water star one is at the front door, which represents wisdom, which is what they were looking for. And then, of course, we have uh, when they change it into a museum, and maybe they change the period of the building. And, and then, as you approach the building, you come from this direction, which is a four and one combination, very good for academic success. So if you're, if you're studying flying stars and you know about four and one combination, then I can recommend something for you to use for that. So you see the four and one, they come to the door and then uh, they bring the wisdom chi into the building there. So what I actually recommend is four writing brushes on a stand. It represents academic success. So if you're studying Feng Shui, you want to enhance your, uh, your knowledge, you can study four writing brushes and in fact last time I came I sent a set to Sylvia as a gift and she put them in her house I'm not sure where she put them but uh, it worked quite well because within a month she and I were both offered a job uh, writing for a Russian feng shui magazine <laughs> <laughs> so it worked very well for us <laughs> and we got paid you see so giving a gift has its rewards <laughs> Uh, so right down into the south of, of China now, we go into uh, Hong Kong. 
And as I was saying, I run Fung Shou Tours of Hong Kong. Now, the first thing is about, I um, just want to show you this picture, water. The most important thing about water is that it should be dancing like this. Uh, this is a really amazing, wonderful temple. It's a Taoist temple in, uh, in Hong Kong, and you can go there and, and pray for whatever you want. Any of the worldly, earthly things that people need, you know, academic success or love or health, all those sorts of things, this is, this is what you do at a Taoist temple. Uh, at the, the next door, on the next train line, is another temple, which is a Buddhist temple. And usually when you go to a Buddhist temple, it's more for personal enlightenment. Uh, so these are, this is the skyline of Hong Kong, and Hong Kong's a really amazing place because, of course, it has every building is designed using Feng Shui. And uh, I always love to go there. I was there last week before I came here. I went to Hong Kong and then Israel and then, then here, and it's just uh, really wonderful to, to go there and actually study the buildings because you know that they've been designed using Feng Shui. So when I go to Hong Kong and I take groups there, we always go to, the, especially the central business district. You see the, the Bank of China. And uh, the uh, uh, Hong Kong Shanghai Bank is here, uh, the Chong Kong building, and uh, many other famous places. Because even in Hong Kong, you know, they're, they're narrowing the harbour to, to reclaim the land. And so by narrowing the harbour, they're, they're restricting the water flow. So water is money. We want the money to flow. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I'll speak to you later.